Good evening, aspirants. Welcome to Daily News Analysis, brought to you by Shankar Ayes Academy. Today's date is 20th October 2023. Displayed here are the list of topics we are going to see today. Now let us get into the discussion. Look at this article from Science Page. It talks about advancements made by artificial intelligence in the field of ophthalmology. Here, ophthalmology refers to diagnosis and treatment of disorders related to eye. So in this news article discussion, we shall see some basics about artificial intelligence. It is important topic for our prelims exam as there are frequent questions being asked about new emerging technologies. Firstly, artificial intelligence refers to development of computer systems that can perform tasks that actually require human intelligence. Artificial intelligence can perform tasks like problem solving, learning, reasoning, perception and understanding of natural language. Note that artificial intelligence has various branches like machine learning, deep learning, natural language processing, robotics, etc. As we are familiar about artificial intelligence, we shall see about machine learning and deep learning in this discussion. Just knowing about the basic information and the main difference between them is enough for our exam. See machine learning and deep learning both are types of artificial intelligence and they are closely related concepts. Firstly, machine learning uses data and algorithm to imitate the way that humans learn and it gradually improves its accuracy. Let me explain you how machine learning works. Imagine you want to teach a computer how to recognize cats. Instead of telling it what exactly a cat looks like, you show the computer a lot of pictures with cats and without cats. Slowly it learns to tell the difference. Over the time, it gets better at recognizing cats just like we get better at recognizing things with practice. So in simple words, machine learning is all about training computers to make decisions based on data and examples rather than giving them instructions. It is like teaching them to learn from experience just like we learn from our mistakes and successes. The examples of machine learning are found in our everyday applications like Spotify and Netflix. They use machine learning algorithms to recommend music or TV shows based on our previous history. Self-driving cars are also examples of machine learning. Now coming to the deep learning. The deep learning is a branch of machine learning and it uses artificial neural networks that mimic the process of human brain. Some of the examples of deep learning, virtual assistants, chatbots, speech recognition, image analysis and caption generation. Even though these two concepts that is machine learning and deep learning look more or less similar, they have main differences between them. Now let us see what are the differences between machine learning and deep learning. Firstly, the main difference between machine learning and deep learning is that Machine learning requires some human intervention to correct its errors, while deep learning does not require any human intervention at all, because deep learning can correct its own errors without need for human help. Secondly, machine learning uses algorithms to function, while deep learning has its own neural network. Thirdly, deep learning provides higher accuracy, where machine learning provides lesser accuracy compared to deep learning. Lastly, deep learning requires larger data to get trained, whereas machine learning requires lesser data than deep learning. This is why machine learning takes less time to get trained than deep learning. So these are some of the important differences between machine learning and deep learning. So in this discussion, we saw some basic information about machine learning, deep learning and main differences between them. So this is all about this discussion. Now let us move to the next topic. Now look at this news article. It says that Greater Chennai Corporation is planning to establish compressed biogas plants at various locations by 2024. Through this, the corporation is planning to utilize 30% of municipal solid waste produced in the city for biogas production. So this is all about the news article. In this context, we will see some points about biogas and the steps taken by government to increase the biogas production. See, biogas is primarily produced through anaerobic digestion of organic matter, such as 
அக்ரிகல்ச்சரல் வேஸ்ட் அனிமல் மேன்யூர் அண்ட் முனிசிபல் வேஸ்ட் டு சே இட் சிம்பிளி பயோகேஸ் இஸ் ப்ரொடியூஸ்ட் வென் மைக்ரோ ஆர்கானிசம் டீகம்போஸ் த ஆர்கானிக் மேட்டர் பயோகேஸ் இஸ் அ மிக்சர் ஆஃப் மெனி கேஸஸ் லைக் மீத்தேன் அண்ட் கார்பன் டைஆக்சைட் நோட் தட் மீத்தேன் இஸ் த ப்ரைமரி காம்போனன்ட் ஆஃப் பயோகேஸ் தட் இஸ் ஃபிஃப்டி பர்சன்டேஜ் டு செவன்டி பர்சன்டேஜ் ஆஃப் பயோகேஸ் இஸ் கம்ப்ரைஸ்ட் ஆஃப் மீத்தேன் அண்ட் மீத்தேன் இஸ் ரெஸ்பான்சிபிள் ஃபார் த எனர்ஜி வேல்யூ ஆஃப் பயோகேஸ் கேஸஸ் லைக் கார்பன் டைஆக்சைடு ஹைட்ரஜன் சல்ஃபைடு அண்ட் வாட்டர் வேப்பர் ஆர் ஆல்சோ ப்ரெசன்ட் இன் பயோகேஸ் நவ் வாட் ஆர் த அட்வான்டேஜஸ் ஆஃப் பயோகேஸ் ஃபர்ஸ்ட்லி இட் இஸ் அ ரெனியூபிள் சோர்ஸ் ஆஃப் எனர்ஜி ஆஸ் வி நோ இட் இஸ் ப்ரொடியூஸ்ட் ஃப்ரம் ஆர்கானிக் வேஸ்ட் மெட்டீரியல் தென் பயோகேஸ் ஆஃபர்ஸ் கிளீன் பேர்னிங் கம்பேர்ட் டு கன்வென்ஷனல் ஃபாசில் ஃபியூயல்ஸ் லைக் கோல் அண்ட் ஆயில் கன்வெர்டிங் முனிசிபல் சாலிட் வேஸ்ட் இன் டு பயோகேஸ் ஹெல்ப்ஸ் டு அட்ரஸ் த ப்ராப்ளம் ஆஃப் அர்பன் லேண்ட்ஃபில்ஸ் ஃபைனலி பயோகேஸ் ஆஃபர்ஸ் வெர்சடைலிட்டி it can be used for various applications including electricity generation heating cooking and as a vehicle fuel so these are some of the important advantages of biogas now we shall see what are the issues associated with biogas the first issue is variability in composition as we saw earlier biogas has varying proportion of many gases but the composition of these gases varies greatly the composition is influenced by the feed stock we use and the anaerobic digestion that is employed so the inconsistency in the methane composition limits the application of biogas for example the internal combustion engines used in vehicles cannot efficiently use biogas the second issue is regarding impurities biogas often contains impurities such as hydrogen sulfide moisture and other trace elements see this hydrogen sulfide can cause corrosion in the equipments and the presence of moisture reduces the energy content of biogas so the presence of impurity is one of the important concern in using biogas the third issue is low energy density biogas has low energy density compared to other conventional fossil fuels lastly there is a issue of economic viability although biogas has large environmental benefits the economic viability of biogas is a huge concern due to high capital investment and high operational cost so these are some of the important issues associated with biogas finally let us look at the steps taken by government to promote biogas production and consumption firstly we have waste to energy program wte program this program is implemented by ministry of new and renewable energy this program provides financial assistance to support setting up of bio cng generation plants and these plants uses waste from urban industrial and agricultural processes then there is a scheme called gobardhan scheme it is galvanizing organic bio argo resources then scheme it is implemented by department of drinking water and sanitation this scheme provides financial assistance for setting up of community level biogas plants and it is focused primarily on solid waste management then we have sustainable alternative towards affordable transportation also known as satat initiative our government plans to set up 5000 bio cng plants that is bio compressed natural gas plants this initiative encourages entrepreneurs to establish bio cng plants and supply the bio cng to oil marketing companies for use as automotive fuel lastly there is national biogas and manure management program it is a central sector scheme under ministry of new and renewable energy through this scheme our government aims to promote the use of biogas as a cooking fuel and also promote the use of slurry produced from biogas plants as organic fertilizer so these are some of the initiatives taken by our government to support the production and consumption of biogas So in this discussion we have seen the basics about biogas major advantages of biogas and what are the concerns related to biogas and finally some steps taken by government to increase the production and consumption of biogas so this is all regarding this discussion now let us move to the next topic look at this editorial article it is about india's food system it covers two aspects of food system one is the challenge faced by india's food system and then the steps that can be taken to address these challenges so this is about the editorial article given here before looking at the editorial in detail 
first let us cover up the basics what is food system see normally we will talk about food we mainly focus on the food production aspect but in the food system approach the entire chain is taken into account so the food system includes production processing distribution and consumption of food the food system approach even takes into account of food wastage management the food system approach focuses on the need for coordination and cooperation among various stakeholders including farmers food processors retailers policy makers and consumers through this it aims to ensure the sustainability and efficiency of entire food system now let us get into the discussion as per our current practice let us cover the points mentioned in the editorial by trying to address a main question now look at the question critically examine the importance of india's food system in achieving food security the key word here is critically examine so we know when the word critically examine comes we must first identify the main argument in the question then we must assess the strength and weakness of the argument provided in the question finally we must give a balanced conclusion for example in this question the main argument around the statement is india's food system in achieving food security so in our answer we must write few points about significance of india's food system in achieving the food security then we have to write about the challenges to india's food system and finally in the conclusion part we have to take a balanced stand and then write few points about the steps that can be taken to address these challenges so this is how we are going to approach this question now before we approach this question let us take a look at the syllabus in prelims this discussion fall under economic and social development sustainable development poverty inclusion demographics social sector initiatives etc in mains this topic comes under gs paper 3 under the topic of major cropping patterns in various parts of country and it also comes under the topic issues related to direct and indirect farm subsidies and minimum support prices public distribution system objectives functioning limitations revamping issue of buffer stocks and food security so this is all about the syllabus now coming to the question in the introduction part you can define what a food system is at the start of the discussion i gave you some points regarding food system approach right you can use the same points here for the introduction now coming to the body of the answer in the body of the answer let us give a few points about significance of india's food system in ensuring food security as we already know the food system approach deals with production processing distribution and consumption of food so for this part of the question we have to write india specific points about production processing distribution and consumption of food and we have to relate how these process ensures food security now let us take up the protection part since adopting the green revolution india's food production has increased rapidly the green revolution helped to transform india from a begging bowl to the food basket of the world the total food grain production in india in 1950 was around 50 million tons this has increased many fold over the years according to economic survey of 2022 to 2023 the food grain production in india was around 315.7 million tons the pulse production was around 23.8 million tons and horticulture production was around 342.3 million tons So India has transformed itself into a food surplus nation. The increasing food production has helped to ensure the food security in India. Now coming to the next aspect that is processing. Food processing is mainly done as a value addition and to increase the shelf life of the food. In this part of answer, you can mention about the steps taken by government in aiding the food processing sector. You can start by mentioning the creation of separate ministry for food processing then you can mention programs like maha food park scheme scheme for integrated cold chain and value addition infrastructure pradhan mantri kisan sampada yojana pradhan mantri formalization of micro food processing enterprises scheme and extension of protection linked incentive to food processing sector all these efforts will ensure food processing on one hand 
it increases the shelf life of the food and also improves the income of farmers due to value addition so in this way it helps in ensuring the food security then coming to the distribution part here you can mention about india's pds system and nfsa 2013 that is national food security act of 2013 currently around 80 crore persons have been covered under national food security act for receiving highly subsidized to food grains so this helps to ensure the food security in the country now lastly coming to the conception of the food here you can mention about the role of mid day meal scheme pradhan mantri poshan scheme government urban canteen in providing quality cooked food so these schemes and initiatives helps to ensure the food security in this way you can explain the importance of india's food system in achieving the food security now we will move to the next part of the answer here we are going to talk about the challenges faced by india's food system one way to introduce this section would be to highlight the paradox of india's current food situation india have a contradiction between increasing food production and also persistent hunger this contradiction is often referred to as india's hunger paradox here you can mention about india's poor performance in the global hunger index which is released recently in the global hunger index india was ranked 111 out of 125 countries the editorial provides some data from national family health survey which can be used here 35 percentage of children are stunted 57 percentage of women and 25 percentage of men are anemic so these points highlight the fact that india's food system has failed to address the problem of hunger after this we can start to list out the challenges in india's food system let us start with the production side decreasing food productivity due to decline in natural resources and climate change is one of the major problems to substantiate this point you can mention about 2023 soil health survey according to this survey half of the cultivable land in india has become deficient in organic carbon also note that in states like punjab 3/4 of the groundwater source is over exploited so these factors lead to decrease in food productivity which poses a serious threat to food security you can also mention about the declining farm income here you can mention about the data provided by transforming rural india foundation according to a report by transforming rural india foundation more than 68 percentage of marginal farmers supplement their incomes with non farm activities like mandrega and casual labor you can also mention about the ill effects of green revolution mainly the role of green revolution in impacting the diversity of food in the country now coming to the processing part here you can highlight about the lack of cold storage facilities inadequate market linkages due to this food wastage has become a big problem in india according to fssai one third of all food in india is wasted or gets spoiled before it is eaten you can also highlight the fact that even though our government has taken many efforts food processing is still not up to the mark in india in india approximately 2 percentage of fruits and vegetables 8 percentage marine 35 percentage milk and 6 percentage of poultry are only processed these numbers are very low so there are many challenges in the processing part also now moving on to the distribution part here you can mention about india's problematic pds system the pds system in india faces various challenges like faulty identification of beneficiaries which results in exclusion errors leakage corruption and reducing storage capacity due to this the food does not reach the intended beneficiaries even though there is excess food protection finally coming to the consumption part here you can mention about low diversity in diet high consumption of processed sugar increase in junk food consumption and negligence of native food that is leading to hidden hunger so these are some of the challenges that india's food system faces now coming to the conclusion part in the conclusion part you can mention that even though india's food system faces many challenges 
steps must be taken to address these challenges and to ensure food security you can mention some suggestions to address these challenges the first one is shifting consumer demand to a more healthier and sustainable diet government can also use the public distribution system midday meal scheme railway scattering urban canteens and public and institutional procurement to promote sustainable diet secondly steps must be taken to augment farmer income through the national mission on natural farming the government must aid the farmer to transition to more renumerative and regenerative agricultural practices on one hand this will increase farmers income and on other hand it will arrest land degradation currently the overall government funding for sustainable agriculture is less than 1% of agricultural budget so this must be increased to aid the farmers finally the entire farm to fork value chain can be made sustainable and inclusive here the corporations must focus on acquiring sustainably produced products so these are some of the steps that can be taken to address the challenges faced by india's farm system these points can be incorporated in the conclusion part so this is all regarding this discussion here we have seen the significance of india's food system in achieving food security then we have seen challenges in various process of food system and then we also saw what are the steps that can be taken to address those challenges so this is all regarding this discussion now let us move to the next topic now look at this news article recently an earthquake of magnitude 6.3 struck afghanistan after a few days multiple earthquakes of similar strength killed at least 1000 people in the country so in this context only this article here is written in our analysis we are going to see about the basics of earthquake the reasons for frequent earthquake in afghanistan and also the reasons for earthquake in india firstly let us see the basis for earthquake to happen this can be explained by plate tectonic theory see according to the theory earth is made up of seven major plates and 20 minor plates these plates are continuously moving with respect to each other know that this movement is due to the heat generated inside the earth moreover the edges of these plates are called plate boundaries and there are fault lines between the two plates most of the earthquake happened between these fault lines see faults are nothing but cracks or fractures on the earth crust the plates on either side of the fault line would slide past each other and this creates an earthquake this is how an earthquake happens basically earthquake is a sudden trembling or shaking of earth surface the point where the energy is released is called the focus of earthquake and it is also called hypocenter it is always present deep under the earth the point nearest to the focus is called epicenter this point is the first one to experience the earthquake waves note that this point is directly above the focus on the surface of the earth so this is the basics of earthquake now let us see why earthquakes are frequently happening in afghanistan the main reason lies with the geography of afghanistan see afghanistan is located at a critical juncture where the meeting of indian and eurasian plate takes place know that these plates will often collide leading to significant tectonic activity moreover this region has many fault lines like chamon fault main pamir thrust which are the sources of earthquakes moreover afghanistan is located on the eurasian plate see in the western side of afghanistan the arabian plates subducts under eurasian plate and in the eastern side of the afghanistan the indian plate subducts under eurasian plate so in the middle of this the country of afghanistan is present and also note that in the southern side of the afghanistan the arabian and indian plates attach together and they both subducts under eurasian plate so all these movements create faults and these faults are the source of major earthquakes happening in afghanistan now let us see the reasons for earthquakes in india according to bureau of indian standards india has been grouped into four seismic zones zone 5 zone 4 zone 3 and zone 2 now that zone 5 is highly prone to earthquake which means it is a most dangerous zone whereas zone 2 has lower incidence of earthquake 
Now let us see the reasons for earthquakes in various parts of India. First of all, let's take the Himalayan belt. The main reason for earthquake in this region is due to the movement of Indian plate towards Eurasian plate. Moreover, there is also a collision between Burma plate with the Java Sumatra plate in this belt. Due to these collisions only, a long strain is created in the underlying rocks and the energy gets released in the form of earthquake. Now coming to the peninsular India. We all know that it is one of largest stable regions in the world. Though it is believed to be stable, we have seen various earthquakes in the past such as Bhuj earthquake, Latur earthquake, Koina earthquake etc. The main reason is due to the stresses resulting from collision of plates in India and North Asia. Moreover, presence of rift or deep falls in the region like Narmada rift valley, Tapti rift, Kurudwadi rift is the major reason for earthquake in this region. The third area is about Andaman Nicobar Islands. Here the sea floor displacement and underwater volcanoes will disturb the equilibrium of earth surface creating earthquake in this region. If you take northeastern region there is Kopili fault zone which is responsible for seismic activity in this region. See it is a 300 km fault line extending from Manipur to the tri-junction of Bhutan, Arunachal Pradesh and Assam. This region is located closer to Himalayan frontal thrust. This tectonically active region falls under highest seismic hazard zone that is zone 5. Moreover, this zone has witnessed many earthquakes in the past. So this is all about the reasons for earthquakes in major earthquake prone areas in India. So in this discussion we have saw the basics about earthquakes, why earthquakes are frequently happening in Afghanistan and what are the reasons for earthquakes happening in India. So this is all about this discussion. Now let us move to the next topic. Now look at this article. Yesterday a division bench of Kerala High Court has directed Malabaram Legal Service Authority to inquire about the houses constructed by state government which were built for tribal hamlets. And the court has asked to submit a report on whether the houses were habitable and if any allotment certificates has been issued to the tribes. So this is the crux of the article given here. In this context, let us quickly go through provisions of legal aid in India and about National Legal Service Authority. Firstly know that legal aid means providing legal assistance to poor persons in any judicial proceedings before the court or tribunals or any authority. Here note that providing free legal aid to weaker section is a duty of state under directive principles of state policy. Under part 4 of Indian constitution article 39a states that government has to provide free legal aid to ensure that opportunities for securing justice are not denied to any citizen. And also note that article 14 and article 22 makes it obligatory for state to ensure equality before law and a legal system which promotes justice on the basis of equal opportunity to all. So these provisions ensure free legal aid to citizens of India. Based on these constitutional provisions, Union government has established National Legal Service Authority that is NALSA in 1995 to provide free legal aid for marginalized sections. The National Legal Service Authority is a statutory body in India and it is constituted under Legal Services Authority Act 1987. NALSA provides free legal services to marginalized and weaker sections of society and it also aims to ensure that justice is accessible to all regardless of economic or social status. It plays a significant role in promoting legal awareness and empowering individuals to seek justice. The NALSA's mission is to secure justice for underprivileged and ensure that everyone has equal access to legal aid and representation. Note that Chief Justice of India is patron in chief of NALSA. Now coming to the important functions of NALSA. Firstly, it provides free legal aid and legal advice to marginalized sections. It also spread legal awareness to all the citizens in the country. It organizes low adalats and it also promotes the settlement of disputes through alternate dispute resolution mechanisms. Some examples of alternate dispute mechanisms include arbitration, conciliation, judicial settlement through low adalat or mediation. Finally, it provides compensation to victims of crime. 
So these are important functions of NALSA. Now who are eligible for getting free legal services? Beneficiaries such as women, children, members of SCST community, industrial workmen, disabled persons, victims of mass disorder, etc. So these people can get free legal services under National Legal Services Authority. So this is all about this discussion. Now let us move to the next topic. Look at this article. Yesterday, Supreme Court bench issued a notice to Delhi police on petitions challenging the arrest and remand of News Click founder under the Draconian Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. The issue may not be relevant for our examination, but UAPA is very important in both prelims and mains perspective. So in today's news article discussion, let us go through UAPA. That is Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. See, UAPA was initially passed in 1967 under the Congress government led by previous Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. It was an upgrade on Terrorist and Disruptive Activities Prevention Act, TADA Act and the Prevention of Terrorism Act. Due to rapid change in the technique and pattern of terrorism, UAPA Act of 1976 is amended several times and the recent amendment was done in 2019. Now we shall see the provisions of the Act. UAPA Act mainly deals with unlawful activities. What does unlawful activity mean? Unlawful activity means any action taken by organization or individual who intends to bring session or results into separation or disrupts the sovereignty and integrity of India. According to the Act, if the central government has opinion that any association has become unlawful association, it may issue notification under official gazette and declare such association to be unlawful. Under the Act, the central government may designate an organization as terrorist organization if it commits or participates in the act of terrorism, prepares for terrorism, promotes terrorism or otherwise involved in terrorism. The act was amended in 2019 and it additionally empowers the government to designate individual persons as terrorists on the same grounds. The act empowers the officers of National Investigative Agency with the rank of inspector and above to investigate the cases regarding unlawful activities. The approval of Director General of NIA is required for the seizure of property under this UAPA Act. The Act defines terrorist acts that are committed within the scope of any of the treaties listed in the schedule of the Act. The treaties include Convention for Suppression of Terrorist Bombings, Convention Against Taking of Hostages, International Convention for Suppression of Acts of Nuclear Terrorism. So these are some of the important provisions covered under the Act. So this is all regarding this discussion. Now let us move to the next topic. Now we have come to the prelims practice question discussion. Look at the first question. How many of following statements about LPG are correct? LPG is a mixture of propane and butane gases. LPG is stored and distributed in its gaseous state under high pressure. In the case of a spill, LPG quickly dissipates making it safer. LPG has lower octane rating compared to gasoline. The first statement is correct. Look at the second statement, it is incorrect. LPG is stored and distributed in its liquid form under moderate pressure. Look at the third statement, it is also incorrect. In case of spill, LPG does not dissipate quickly. This is because LPG is heavier than air and this property make LPG unsafe for use. The fourth statement is also wrong. LPG has higher octane rating compared to gasoline. So only the first statement is correct. So the correct answer is option A. Now look at the second question. It is about National Legal Service Authority. National Legal Service Authority is a constitutional body established under Article 124 of Indian Constitution. This statement is not correct because it is a statutory body and it was constituted under Legal Services Authorities Act 1987. Look at the second statement. It provides free legal aid and services to weaker section of society. Yes, this statement is correct. Look at the third statement. The Chief Justice of India serves as Executive Chairman of NALSA. This statement is incorrect because Chief Justice of India is a patron in chief of NALSA. A sitting judge of Supreme Court is appointed as Executive Chairman of NALSA. So the correct answer is option A, only one. Now look at the third question. 
Consider the following statements about Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. The decision of central government to designate an organization as terrorist organization under UAPA is not subject to judicial review. This statement is incorrect because the decision of central government is subjected to judicial review. The recent amendment to the act extended the maximum period of detention to 365 days. This statement is also incorrect because the maximum period of detention under UAPA is 180 days and the recent amendment did not extend the maximum period of detention. Look at the third statement. National Investigation Agency is the sole investigating agency responsible for all cases registered under UAPA. This statement is also incorrect because in addition to NIA, other law enforcement agencies can also investigate and handle cases under UAPA. So the correct answer is option D. This is the main question for you today. Interested aspirants can write the answer and post it in the comment section. With this, we have come to the end of the discussion. If you like the video, please share it with your friends and don't forget to subscribe to Shankara A's YouTube channel. Thank you.